I'm uh, Mark Quigley. I'm a geologist from the University of Canterbury. Um, and I'm delighted to be here with my colleague Matthew Hughes. Sorry, I almost introduced you as Matthew Hughes. That's not Matthew. <laughs> Matthew Hughes. Uh, Matthew's from the Department of Civil and Natural Resources Engineering. So you've got, um, you've got full access to us for an hour and a half or something like that to ask us whatever you want. Um, the theme of this talk and the theme of the Land Hub is all about scientific transparency and about providing you access to whatever sort of scientific information that you want to obtain from us. Now we're able to speak on anything. Um, while Ma Matthew and I both draw funding from the Earthquake Commission, an interesting thing is none of our results, none of our uh, reporting of those re results is influenced by the Earthquake Commission. So I'm here to just give you the straight information that I've learned from my own research um, in a direct way as possible, relevant to what's already happened to us and what may, what are the possibilities going forward. Um, some of the information will be directly relevant to you if you live in the Port Hills, some of it will be directly relative to, to you if you live on top of an active fault, some of it will be relatively important to you if you live on liquefaction susceptible sediments. Um, so I'm going to speak for about 25 minutes or so and then I'm going to turn it over to Matthew and he's going to touch on some different themes uh, related to flooding and, and so on after that. So yeah, really appreciate you attending and uh, we'll just get right into it. So I want to start with this image here. Actually, can we get the lights? Is that possible? Are there lights somewhere? Thanks. I don't know that makes any difference, does it? Does it make a little bit of difference? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so this is a photo I took. This is quite a famous photo now. I took this on uh, September 7th in uh, 2010. This is a photo from, uh, from a helicopter of the Darfield earthquake surface rupture. And it highlights, of course, things directly related to hazards living right on top of active faults. And also, once faults rupture, how that seismic energy cascades through the environment, and thank you, and influences all of us who don't live right on top of active faults. So we're going to talk a little bit about fault rupture at the start, and then we're going to move on to other sorts of hazards. But um, this image here is, uh, shows basically a decade of seismicity prior to when the Canterbury earthquake sequence actually began in the region. And the important thing to note here, well, there's several important things. Here's Christchurch. Each one of these pink dots is a magnitude 3 or greater earthquake, an epicenter. So in that decade, we actually did have a few local small earthquakes. And, you know, magnitude 3s-ish, we just sort of ignore or don't feel those. So we probably, those didn't really show up on our radar. But there was earthquake in other parts of, earthquakes in other parts of Canterbury um, through that period. Important things to highlight on, no obvious precursory seismicity in this area here, which was to become the Darfield earthquake uh, sequence. So there wasn't really anything there that was telling us uh, that it was a major earthquake was imminent. However, we did have a history of what we call earthquake clustering. So in the mid-90s, there was a whole series of magnitude 6 earthquakes close, closely spaced together uh, in space and in time in the Southern Alps. So we know that actually, you know, this area is susceptible to earthquake clustering. So for that perspective, what happened to us here was not actually that much of a surprise in terms of the clustering of that sequence. Um, we still had, uh, I guess, higher rates of seismicity in the areas where we had that sequence. And that highlights this kind of long-term decay of aftershock rates. That even, you know, a decade after these events, there were still slightly more earthquakes in that area than there were in surrounding areas that hadn't been influenced by that mid-90s sequence. Um, we, of course, did have local earthquakes in 1869 and 1870, in addition to regional earthquakes that caused damage in Christchurch. Um, there's some interesting reports uh, following this earthquake that uh, the uh, tide ran up higher in, Heathcote, uh, in the Heathcote River. So there's some sort of fragmental evidence that there may have been some subsidence, some liquefaction in this earthquake. Here And as uh, we begin to learn more about that earthquake, we actually find actually probably there was some liquefaction in parts of eastern Christchurch there. Despite that, I think um, a large number of people in Christchurch kind of had this NIMBY earthquake culture, and not in my backyard. It's going to happen in the west coast. It's going to happen in Wellington and so on. Um, and then there were people like me who went and purchased properties um, knowing what I know in eastern Christchurch in Avonside right by the river for a variety of other reasons, whilst acknowledging that it said liquefaction on my limb. I decided there was a variety of other reasons why to, to purchase that property. So I think that just highlights some of the challenges we face. If housing's available to us, we will buy it. Um, no seismic hangover in terms of no earthquakes still being recorded as aftershocks from those events. Okay, so this is how the picture changes. 
this is the next, uh, the next few years from September 4, 2010 to 2013. And again, all these magnitude three or greater earthquakes um, throughout this region, 100 kilometers east-west, 30 kilometers north-south. Um, there's other areas that we're monitoring where we had an increase in seismicity rate. So we're doing geological studies up in this area here to learn about the earthquake potential of faults there as feature seismic hazards. And other areas that have actually declined in seismicity rate telling us about the changes in stress throughout that region. Now one of the um, interesting things we talk about and that's really important to tell people and to learn about is how things have changed from the way they were before in terms of seismicity and how things are at the moment compared to where, the way they were before. So this is a, this is a plot, this is called a Gutenberg-Richter plot, and it's a beautiful plot because it's just so simple in, at, at some level. The x-axis here, the bottom axis, is earthquake magnitude. So each one of those dots tells you um, an earthquake magnitude, and this axis here is the number of earthquakes that are greater than or equal to that magnitude. Okay, so how you would read this it, is, is the, blue, the blue dots here are all the earthquakes we had in the Canterbury earthquake sequence, in that time frame, September 2010 to 2012. So when you read in the press or whatever, we've had 20,000 earthquakes and all that sort of stuff, okay, it all sounds very impressive. But actually what, what we're most interested in here is how many damaging earthquakes have we had and how does that compare to the rate of damaging, potentially damaging earthquakes we, we used to have in this area. So um, the way I would look at this is if you think about a magnitude five as a potentially damaging earthquake, we've had 10, 20, 30, 40, about 50 magnitude 5 earthquakes, about 50 potentially damaging earthquakes in that two year time frame. And the beautiful thing about earthquakes in terms of simplicity is for every magnitude 6 we get, we get 10 magnitude 5s and 100 magnitude 4s and 1000 magnitude 3s. And that is whether you're looking at a decade of seismicity in Switzerland or 10 years of seismicity in your backyard or 100 years of global seismicity, it follows that pattern. If we look at the rates of seismicity before that, so this is 1940 to 2010 in the same area around Canterbury. You can see we actually had one, two, three earthquakes greater than or equal to magnitude five and 10, 20, about 30 greater than or equal to magnitude four. So we're still getting earthquakes in that area, but the rate in which they are occurring and where they're occurring was, was very different. So the rate of earthquakes, we've got about one magnitude three or greater every four months in that time period. Between September 2010 to 2012, we were getting about 150 magnitude 3 or greater earthquakes per month. So that's about 600 to 700 times greater. We you talk to people, how, how did the rate change? Well, it was about 600 to 700 times greater during the Canterbury earthquake sequence. Now, how does the current rate of seismicity compare to the way it was before? It's still elevated, okay? So the monthly rate of earthquakes in 2014, we're getting about four of them per month. Most of them are not felt. I, I imagine most of you haven't felt an earthquake for quite a while, but we're still about 16 times uh, faster rate of earthquakes in the region than we were during, um, prior to the Darfield earthquake, which is why you often hear or read about through a variety of anti antidotal evidence, we're still at a slightly higher rate of seismic risk than we were prior to the December earthquake, or prior to the um, 2010 Darfield earthquake. Um, the other thing is that the rate of earthquakes decays exponentially following a major earthquake. So following February, you know, the first few days is absolutely terrible, right? Earthquakes all the time, and then the rate just continues to decline with time. That's, that, that relationship has been known since the 1800s. Scientists have understood that relationship. This sequence actually adhered quite well to that. But of course, every time you get another large earthquake, you restart the clock and you, and you refocus it in that, in that regard. Okay, so that's about seismicity. Future seismicity, these are the probabilities of different earthquake magnitudes occurring over different time scales. And so uh, if we just think about the chances of different magnitude earthquakes within the next year occurring in the Canterbury region, which is now quite a broad region, the, the reports of a magnitude five, the, the chances of a magnitude five to 5.9 earthquake is still around 69%, which is quite a high percentage, right? So it's still higher than what it was before the Darfield earthquake. These are the most updated um, numbers from GNS. So if you Google Canterbury aftershocks, GeoNet will pop up and you can go straight to this and get the updated numbers as you want. And the numbers here will all continue to decline with time. Um, but you know, one of the most important things is these, these numbers, what do we do with this? What is 9% is chance of a magnitude six or greater somewhere within 80 kilometers of Christchurch? Is that a high number or a low number? 
I think it's really important to understand that actually 9% on itself is probably a pretty low chance in an absolute sense, but relative to the, the seismic, seismic hazard before, it's still higher, right? Because of the rates that I told you about before, 16 times higher. Okay, we're missing, we're missing part of the top of the screen here. I don't know why, but that's all right. I'm going to talk to you about fault rupture because it's relevant to everyone in the room um, at some level. This is uh, the surface rupture of the Greendale Fault. This is the, the fault that ruptured in the Darfield earthquake. And um, why it's important to understand fault rupture hazard is because in some cases the fault ruptured right through people's front doors and went out their back doors along the fault. The question is, is this a future hazard for Christchurch in areas that we're actively rebuilding in? Is it a potential hazard associated with the February earthquake source? Is it possible that we could have this sort of thing happening within our city limits in the next uh, 100 years, 1,000 years or something? Um, important point as well is this particular strand of the fault had about half a meter of displacement on it. it went right through the front door, right through the kitchen, and you could stay in the kitchen and you could see the, the tiles offset 30, 40 centimeters. But this is a great success story from an engineering perspective because this modern house, well built, stood up and the family was actually still living in there after the earthquake. So in terms of performing its job of li as life safety, this building performed very, very well. The question is, how frequently does this fault rupture? Uh, and so to answer that question, we put a bunch of students in this hole here and they map all the, the gravels and they map all the, the, the strands and all that sort of thing. And what they worked out was actually channels, old channels, ancient channels, 21,000 years old here, were only offset the same amount as stuff on the surface right above them. So that means that since that channel has been sitting there 21,000 years ago, when that channel was abandoned, it's only had one earthquake, the Darfield earthquake. That's all it's had on that fault. So 20,000 years of quiescence before the rupture, before rupturing on our watch. However, the timing of the last earthquake, if we dig a little bit deeper, we could find a, a channel that was 28,000 years old. It was offset twice. So sometime between 28 and 21,000 years ago, that fault ruptured. That's how we understand that sort of stuff. So when, before we worked any of this out, the question was, do we allow people to rebuild on the, on the fault zone, right on top of the fault? They own that property, that's where they want their house to be. Can they rebuild right on top of the fault again? And actually, as we were doing this investigation, construction was going on right on top of the fault. So people were already going and rebuilding on there. What we've learned is actually from a fault zone avoidance standpoint, which is this map here, you can see in the top, from a fault zone avoidance, we can actually say, here is, here is the, the zone along the fault where you could avoid building on top of to avoid rupture and future earthquakes. But because this fault only ruptures once every 20,000 years, you can actually build right on top of it. It's not a drama, right? Your house is not gonna still be there the next time this thing ruptures. Right? That's the logic that goes into that sort of decisions. So that talks about fault zone avoidance and fault zone avoidance criteria varies depending on how frequently the fault ruptures and the type of material you want to build on top, the type of infrastructure you want to build on top of it. So there's fault zone avoidance around the Wellington Fault that is really strict in places where it can be because that fault ruptures very frequently. So the chance of it actually having a rupture in the lifespan of your house is actually reasonably high. In this case, you know, people can go for it. Now, mitigating the effects of fault rupture. This is a great success story from Alaska, actually. So geologists studied this fault called the Denali Fault here, and they worked out the frequency of past earthquakes and how much those, 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 the fault actually slipped in the past earthquakes. This is the Alaska pipeline. What the geologists said to the engineers is, put the pipeline, uh, the ground may move up to eight meters or so in the next earthquake. So you can put the pipeline on rollers so the ground will move beneath, but the pipeline won't fracture in the earthquake. Okay? Sure enough, major earthquake happens on the Denali Fault. The ground moves, but not a drop of oil is spilt in the Denali pipeline. Amazing success story because of the kinds of studies that were done here. All right? So the key point, you can avoid faults or you can design for fault rupture. It's not a big drama. And faults that have long rec return times, actually we don't really need to worry so much about them from that perspective. Now, relevance to Christchurch. We have a lot of building um, going on in the southwest part of the city. Uh, this is the area called the seismic gap. 
And the reason we refer to it in that regard is because it has released less seismic energy than the surrounding parts of the fault. So an important question is, can we get a Greendale fault type rupture that's actually going to break through to the surface and cause this sort of damage to people's properties there? That's pretty relevant, pretty important question to ask. So we, we actually think this is quite a complex zone that's not capable of generating major earthquakes. Um, it's a series of smaller faults in there. But let's take a worst case scenario and say, well, actually, if all these red dots here, if, if all these earthquakes somehow uh, connected structurally and there was a major earthquake in there, how big could it be and would it cause a surface rupture? When we do those sort of analyses, we find out that actually combined rupture, we might get up to 5.8 to a magnitude 6 earthquake in that area. That's still some, something we'd say is possible going forward. However, significantly larger earthquakes that occurred in the Canterbury earthquake sequence and similar types of material did not cause any surface rupture. The faults just aren't long enough in this area to actually po pose a surface rupture hazard in our opinion. All right, and that's how we make those sort of decisions. So in this particular instance, we're not so worried, we're not so worried about future surface rupture hazard. So if you are engaged with people in that area or you live in that area, uh, the, the best information we have at the moment is it's pretty unlikely that that poses a hazard to you. Um, there was a question about why there was no fault avoidance zone uh, made around February 2011 fault. So this image here shows land that has gone up and land that has gone down. I'm not going to touch on this too much because Matthew's going to focus on this quite a bit in the um, February earthquake. And these dashed lines here are where the faults that ruptured in February actually would project to the surface um, if they did. Um, there is no currently defined fault avoidance zone in the southern port hills around that fault because in the February earthquake, the top of the rupture was about 500 meters below the surface. So instead of breaking straight through to the surface and creating that dramatic um, surface rupture pattern, it stopped. And the reason it stopped is the fault was not long enough to have enough slip for that thing to break all the way through to the surface. Okay, probably not even getting very close. Um, the other thing that's quite important is when we study these faults, incredibly difficult to study them because they're quite deep. We can't get any direct information from them very easily. So we use different types of proxies. And so we've been using rockfall to try and understand prehistoric rockfalls to try and understand how frequently this fault ruptures. Um, we would estimate at the moment that these sort of faults, the February and the June faults, probably have recurrence intervals on the order of six to 8,000 years. That's the best information we have at the moment. Okay, so again, from a fault avoidance zone perspective, putting houses right on top of where those faults would project to the surface is not a problem. Because we just, the faults don't rupture frequently enough, and the top of the rupture is sufficiently deep that it's not an issue that we actually need to really seriously worry about going forward. Okay, however, there are lineaments, lines of earthquake damage in parts of the Port Hills that require more investigation. So, for instance, a whole series of houses that kind of line up along, even with the, the Huntsbury Reservoir, that kind of line up that are a concern in terms of what's going on there, why there are these linear arrays of damage zones. So that's a focus of further study for us. But certainly, you know, major fault rupture hazard is not something we worry about too much. Okay, I'm going to touch on rockfall before I touch on liquefaction. So, um, as you well know, there are plenty of modern houses built right on the edges of cliffs in Christchurch and plenty of houses built um, too close to potential rockfall zones right on the base of the cliff. And we kind of knew that before and we definitely know that now. All right, this is a major, a major hazard for us. And so as a consequence, there's been a variety of uh, uh, areas uh, demarcated red zone. And we can, we can talk about that in the question and answer period if you wish. Um, the question is how frequently do we get catastrophic events like this? Um, and I'll get to that in a second. One of the things I think is a sequence of images that are particularly poignant and that you can all gain access to if you go to Google Earth and click on historical imagery. You can get, date, you can date, you can get um, imagery dating from different times through the Canterbury earthquake sequence and you can see uh, how we might have made some bad decisions, the, the, the royal we, not, not myself. Um, and this is an area, this is in Sumner, and this is prior to the September earthquake big steep cliff in this area here and lots of rocky cliff all around it, okay? And there's a vacant lot here right up against that, uh, right up against that cliff face there, right? Obviously targeted for development. This is after the September earthquake, after the Darfield earthquake. 
when we did have some rockfall on Castle Rock in various places in the Port Hills, but it wasn't severe by any stages. But the threat of an earthquake was, local earthquake was real. Um, this was further development in the starting of building right up against that cliff face prior to the February earthquake. Okay? So despite that kind of elevated seismic hazard, this went ahead. And then this shows what that site looks like now. So this is after the June, after the February, June, and December earthquakes, you can see that place has been abandoned. Now I can just imagine you can see large rocks that have fallen all around that area here in those earthquakes. You could just imagine that if that February earthquake had happened, say, a few months later or something, it could have been a major problem if there are people living in here or that sort of thing. So it just goes to highlight some of that, um, some of the issues I think that we face as a community going forward. Here's another example of something we did, we did actually do well. So this is a photo I took on February 23rd, um, recognizing these big cracks along the tops of the, the hills and parts of the Port Hills here. Um, and actually these areas were, uh, these people were told to, to leave and these areas were um, treated as very dangerous. And in the June earthquake, you can see that that, there's that tree here, you can see that whole, that whole cliff just gave way, that whole area there. So this is important, the importance of just basic scientific observations actually helping to potentially save lives in this instance. All right. Okay, how frequently does this happen? So it's a very difficult question, very challenging, but this was some of the local stuff we had in the media about this, and this is how we do it. So this picture here shows some of the rockfall at Rapaki, near Rapaki here, uh, that came down from this cliff face. Each one of these blue dots is a boulder that has been mapped that, caused, that came down in the February or June earthquakes. So quite substantial. But one of the things that we noticed here was that there were boulders there before embedded into the landscape that had been there since time X. We don't know. And other earthquakes, like the December earthquake and the Darfield earthquake and other strong earthquakes, didn't cause major rockfall in this area. So it's quite a good recorder of only the strongest earthquakes. So that's useful for us because we can actually say the last time there was a major rockfall event probably tells us about the last time there was really, really strong shaking in that area. That's the logic, the scientific logic. And we know that that's an important question to answer because some of those modern boulders went right through people's houses and into this area. There's all sorts of ongoing land disputes in that area. So we, we dated those boulders in a way analogous to looking at your sunburn to work out how long you've been in the sun. We can actually look at the chemistry of the rocks to work out how long they've been exposed uh, in the, to, to the uh, cosmic rays on the surface of the Earth. And this plot um, is a little bit complicated, but uh, I think the main thing to get from this is this black line here shows the ages that we get. And some of the key things are we actually don't find any major rockfall events in the last 6,000 years at this site. We do find uh, one event around six to 8,000 years ago and one event that we are interpreting to be around 14,000-ish. Um, um, we paint with a broad brush doing this work because it's quite complicated work. But what these other lines are here is if we were getting major events like the, the February and June earthquakes every 500 years, this blue line is what our age distribution would look like. So basically we're pattern matching things to the black line. The black line is what we want to duplicate and we're pattern matching different earthquake scenarios to that. So you can see that blue line look no, looks nothing like that black line, does it? I mean, completely different. So that's not a realistic scenario for rockfall generating events at this site. However, this red line here actually does have that, that sort of double peaked type profile, and that's these rockfall events at seven and 14,000 years, okay? What we're not saying is that no rocks are ever gonna come off of the Port Hills again for another 7,000 years, right? Of course not. What we're saying is the se severity of shaking that we got in the February and June earthquakes and the severity of damage and these sorts of things is quite a rare event. It's on the order of many thousands of years in terms of recurrence. And if we restore the rock mass to a structural integrity similar to what it was prior to Darfield, it's unlikely that there are many seismic sources around the area that are capable of, of causing future rockfall. This just basically goes into that same sort of thing. Okay, now, before I pass over to Matthew, just touching on liquefaction, uh, I call this the Bexley lesson because obviously there, was there were houses still being built in Bexley in 2005 at sea level on the most liquefiable um, sediments, some of the most liquefiable sediments in New Zealand. Um, and again, that just highlights major challenges, right? So this is an area that there's no reason at all that we should have been building on, and we are. And there are places around New Zealand where the exact same thing's happening. 
People are building on cliff faces where rivers are cutting back in to, into their properties at a meter a year. New houses are going up. Right? People are building on areas where in the last earthquake the land come, came up, but in the next earthquake it's going to go down. And we know that, but there's still modern developments going on there. So that, that's kind of a shared responsibility in a way and, and, and highlights a major problem. So this is the red zone in Eastern Christchurch um, where uh, Bexley is obviously part of that now. One of the things we're really interested in is how frequently liquefaction is expected in the future uh, based on the, the intensity of shaking required to cause liquefaction in these properties. So the question could be, well, 10 years from now, should we just plunk more houses back down into the red zone and get on with it because it's not going to happen to us again? And the answer is, is actually quite convincingly from our geologic studies, no. And so what this plot show, is showing here, this is the world's best uh, observational record of liquefaction, and it's from my, the backyard of my own house. That's why it's the best, because I was living there the whole time. And every time there was an earthquake, even a small one and a little fart of sand came out onto the ground, I was there to take a photo of it, measure, it, measure the thickness, and use that to understand how frequently liquefaction occurs and what levels it occurs at. So this graph here shows earthquake magnitude versus peak ground acceleration. I'm sure a lot of you actually have heard this term by now. That's just a measure of the intensity of shaking. And what it shows us that it is in the red zone, in places like this, the intensity of shaking required to cause liquefaction, this is a very low number, right? Very, very, very high susceptibility to liquefaction in future earthquakes from all different types of sources. Each one of these green and blue symbols tells is, 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 an, is a liquefaction-inducing event. So we actually had about 11 episodes of different episodes of liquefaction in Christchurch during the earthquake sequence at very low thresholds. All right. Um, if we look at the seismic hazard model of New Zealand in terms of the return times of this level of shaking, certainly we would expect sub significant liquefaction in the red zone and susceptible materials on the order of, you know, the September type liquefaction on the order of 150 to 300 year return periods, okay, which is quite a short time period to have that sort of stuff recur. Um, the other thing is where liquefaction occurred in the past, it occurs again and again and again in the same spots, all right? There was, at, in various people kind of had ideas about actually earthquakes reduce the susceptibility of the material to liquefaction in future earthquakes because you shake the stuff and you cause some densification, right? What we know is actually there's almost an endless reservoir of this sorts of material beneath the surface. And so actually uh, it would take a lot more earthquakes and a lot more subsidence to actually make much of an impact on the highly susceptible soil. If you've got liquefaction at a at a similar level of shaking in the past here, then 100 years from now, you're probably going to get liquefaction if you have the similar amount of shaking uh, in terms of the intensity. Quite an important um, lesson there. The other one is that every time we dug one of these features up, we found evidence for paleo liquefaction, meaning prehistoric liquefaction had occurred at those sites. We've now done a variety of sites, Kaipoi, Eastern Christchurch, and so on. So there was geologic evidence for past liquefaction there which actually supports the idea that, act, that these sediments are quite young. It supports the idea that liquefaction uh, is quite a regular occurrence in a large amount of Eastern Christchurch. The engineers can tell us that because they know the soils are weak and highly susceptible to liquefaction. We're coming at it from the geologic perspective and the stories are blending perfectly together, right? Rockfall, severe rockfall might occur on the thousands of year time scale. Liquefaction and severe liquefaction might occur on the hundreds of years of time scale. Okay, very different types of hazards. And uh, this is my final slide. So this is uh, something you can do when you've got PhD students. And, and uh, this, is, this is the Avon Loop, and this is an area that's been red zone. But uh, one of my PhD students, Sarah Basson, has been doing a lot of detailed work in this area because it provides a very good example, not only for future development in Christchurch, but all around New Zealand. She's mapped 4,500 or something lateral spreading cracks, and she's interested in how far away could we zone or how far away could we be uh, from the waterways to reduce the worst impacts of liquefaction, okay? So where is the ground cracking the worst, the lateral spreading the worst, the liquefaction the worst, and how far can, do we need to be to go away from those water bodies um, to actually uh, reduce our exposure? And so what she's noticed here, just don't worry so much about the, the colors. The bars are the number of mapped cracks as a function of the distance from the river or the closest free face. And what Sarah's showing here is that actually between 30 and 40 meters, you have quite a reduction 
in terms of the lateral spreading and the cracking and the land damage. Now there are exceptions to that for sure, and Matthew's going to show you an example where hundreds of meters away you had major cracking in Kaipoi. But in general, when you're in these sort of um, environments, that kind of 30 to 40 meters away is, is actually quite useful for understanding whether you're going to get really severe land damage or moderate land damage um, in liquefaction events. What I'm showing you here, um, here are the wastewater pipes or sewage pipes uh, installed in the 1880s in Christchurch. And the sequence I'm about to show you is a good illustration of how the city has expanded across these sediments that have liquefied through time. And you can see essentially or virtually a concentric expansion of the city like that, although with the outer suburbs and Brighton and Sumner and they eventually meet up. Um, but the point about this is, is when we try to understand the physical impacts to the infrastructure lifelines of the city, um, we need to understand the development of the city across these sediments. Uh, in March this year, some colleagues and I, we were re released this report um, as a bit of the screen is chopped off the top there, um, performance of horizontal infrastructure in Christchurch City uh, through the earthquakes. And so that's a publicly available document. You can go online and read it. And so just to quickly summarise some of our findings, I won't go into too much detail, but I'm happy to talk to you in more detail um, later on about this. This is an example of uh, road damage. And so here, We've got the road damage um, um, throughout the city. This was information collected by the Christchurch City Council and the Land Transport Authority, um, and a massive campaign of observations of damage to roads and, and footpaths and curbs and channels was undertaken, um, largely for costing purposes for repair of the roadways in, in Christchurch. And uh, sitting beneath here, we've got observed liquefaction um, after the February 2011 earthquake. And there's a very, very, very good spatial correlation there between the worst liquefaction areas and the road damage. We are similarly looking at bridges throughout the city. The bridge story is a little bit more complicated, um, uh, but uh, certainly my en bridge engineering colleagues are focusing very much on trying to understand how lateral spreading on the banks of the rivers um, uh, uh, damages or has disrupted the structures of bridges and things like that. And of course, these are really critical pieces of infrastructure uh, for the transport system of, of, of Christchurch. And just, um, just in the little legend here, if you can see the little red dot there, we've got bridges that are, have had severe damage or have failed. It means the actual uh, deck of the bridge itself has collapsed and things like that, uh, um, right through to abutment damage. Um, and uh, whether they're structurally sound. And as you can see here, the, the green dots are structurally sound and here in some of the worst liquefaction and lateral spreading areas. And so it, it's a complicated story. We're trying to understand the interactions between the soil movements and how bridges have been constructed to enhance the resilience of their structural design. Okay, so I'm going to that says possible water supply, although it's chopped off at the top there. Uh, so I'm just going to dwell for a couple of minutes on the drinking water system of Christchurch. I've spent much of the last three years understanding how it's been damaged and correlating that with liquefaction. This map here uh, is something that a couple of colleagues and I uh, developed in, at the end of 2011 in response to council requests for a map to give some sort of indication of how the ground might behave in future earthquakes. And Mark has just alluded to the fact that we now know, um, given sufficient um, earthquake shaking and duration, we get liquefaction popping up in the same areas. Um, by the time we developed this, we had already had the September, February and June quakes. And so we had three major events upon which to base this map. And what this map essentially shows is, um, you can't see the legend here, but if you will look at this, our report, you can look at it in more detail. Essentially, the area in red here, uh, which is basically the residential red zone in eastern Christchurch, suffered the worst liquefaction. Um, and as we go out from orange to yellow to green and then to blue, that's the, that's the increasing resistance of the ground to liquefaction. So basically, red is bad ground, right through to blue, which is good ground. And as you can see out to the west here, that's the blue. Basically, uh, the water table is too deep and the, and the types of sediments there too gravelly to liquefy, um, even under significant shaking. So just bear this colour scheme in mind when I flick through uh, to the next slide. Oh, I should say, by the way, and you can't see it here, of course, it's too small. But over here, for each of these zones, we have estimates of vertical ground settlement, 
estimates of lateral movement, and importantly for the pipes under the ground, the types of stresses or pressures exerted um, um, at the ground at the water table surface, uh, and the kinds of pressures that are exerted on pipes under the ground. This graph here uh, shows those bad ground through to good ground here. And this is repairs per kilometre to water, pri water pipes across the city. Um, and so um, essentially what we're seeing here is that from the bad ground through to the good ground, uh, we're actually seeing a drop in the repair rates, or the, uh, equally the damage rates, to these pipes from the bad ground to the good, good ground. Uh, that's exactly what we would have predicted um, prior to the earthquakes if we had thought about it in, 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 in more detail than a lot of people did. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, it's sort of edifying to see that pattern. It, uh, it means that um, our map here is actually a pretty good um, uh, sort of retrospective look at the damage to the pipes, but also um, uh, a pretty good indicator of how the ground might behave and affect certain pipes in the future, bearing in mind that liquefiable areas will liquefy again. These different curves here are actually different pipe types. We've got AC is this blue one here is asbestos cement, um, a widely used pipe material throughout the 20th century, um, and most of the city's water mains were constructed of that. Uh, and the red down the bottom here is galvanized iron, and the, and the sub mains, that's the water pipes coming off the mains and the streets to uh, uh, cul de sacs and your properties, um, uh, that's the red one there, and you can see here that has the highest damage rate. Um, AC is the second uh, highest damage rate. And then in green and purple, we've got basically the modern plastic pipe materials. They were already being installed in Christchurch prior to the quakes. That's just where the general water supply industry was heading. Um, and so what we're seeing here are distinct spatial um, patterns of behavior of, of, of the pipes under the ground. And importantly, key differences in, 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 in what the pipes are made of and how they respond to liquefaction. Uh, this is pretty key, obviously, for the rebuild. We need to take these things into account. I should say, by the way, our liquefaction resistance index map has been used by the Council and SKIRT intensively since late 2011 in guiding thinking about resilient design of our water supply system as well as our wastewater and stormwater. Uh, another thing I've been looking at um, are the modes of failure. So up there it says potable water supply modes of failure. Um, and what do I mean by that is how exactly have the pipes broken? And so here are just a few photos. Here's an here's a asbestos cement water main with what, with what we call uh, a broken back. So basically if you have a pipe um, it can sort of uh, it can do that, or do that, or, or do that. And so a broken back is basically when a big pipe, water main um, uh, splinters in the middle due to um, liquefaction um, and ground movements. And just a few other examples, I won't dwell on too much here, but here for example there's a break, broken cast iron um, uh, main there. Here's another main, you might not be able to see that, but there's a split along there. Um, and a few other types of breakages. So I've spent an awful lot of time trying to understand exactly how things are broken. Um, this, uh, uh, if you focus here on the blue colours on, on this graph and the grey, the blue here is uh, damage to the actual body of the pipe itself. It's the, the cylinder of the pipe itself. And in grey is damage to the fittings on that pipe. So that's the connectors joining pipes. It's the little, um, um, little elbows or L-shaped connectors for pipes changing direction. It's also uh, the connections connecting to the submains that go off to your house. It's the connections to fire hydrants and things like that. And as we can see, a significant part of the damage is not to, is not to the pipe itself at all. It's actually to the fittings on the pipes. And that's because those fittings have tended to be particularly brittle. In the technical terms, they're not ductile. And even plastic fittings are fairly brittle. Um, and so when the pipes are moving around and the, and the ground is shaking, a lot of the fittings are, go are going. And so that's a key piece of information for the industry around supplying water infrastructure to the council to put in the ground so we can have our water uh, lifelines. Um, uh, this information is being used to guide some of the, um, you know, the industry, again, uh, specifications around construction, design and construction of materials. And um, as time goes by in Christchurch, hopefully more resilient fittings will be being put in the ground. 
Why do I say that? It's because a lot of this information was gathered after the water system has been fixed. And so uh, a lot of this information is, is critical to Christchurch's ongoing resilience for its water system. But perhaps as important or more important, these lessons are being learned uh, throughout New Zealand and in fact around the world. This sort of information is, is helping guiding thinking about uh, um, the guidelines and specifications about the water systems all over the place, particularly cities that have followed a similar tra trajectory of development um, to Christchurch, developing um, from the 1880s, and cities all around the world have very similar pipe materials to us uh, um, here. This is a picture of Edgware Road, um, taken in, in late 2011. And what we're looking at here um, is uh, the results of a broken wastewater or sewage pipe. There's a, there's a big sewer main that goes along underneath Edgware Road, and, uh, and it was damaged um, after, quite severely after the uh, uh, February 2011 earthquake. That wasn't apparent at the time, but in the um, subsequent months, uh, what we understand now is that the top of the pipe was fractured and then collapsed in. And so what we're seeing here, are, um, and, but the pipe didn't block up, the flow through the pipe was sufficient to move that f material that fell into it along the pipe and away. So what's been happening here is that the top of the pipe has collapsed in and then it started swallowing in the trench and gravelly sort of sandy material that the pipe's in and then it started uh, eating the surrounding soils and the road. And so um, uh, this was a major, major um, job to fix this thing up. But this is a really good example of what we call network interdependency. So uh, a major part of our work is not just understanding how a particular system, for example, the water system was broken, but the, um, or the wastewater system, but how those breakages link and tie in and affect other systems. In this case, the collapse of the wastewater system has compromised the roadway and the water network, um, or rather the water pipes in the street. You can imagine as the ground started being eaten away, there may, have, may well have been a water pipe um, uh, uh, basically sharing a similar sort of space in the road as the sewer pipe, um, and eventually uh, the, the water pipe would collapse into the hole um, as well, or, or at least the service from that pipe would be compromised. Another key aspect of this is, of course, uh, the roadway itself. Here's another example uh, where we've got a recycling truck that's fallen uh, through the road. And this is a result, um, uh, again, this sort of thing happened because we got collapsed pipes that started eating uh, the, you know, the, road, the material beneath the roadway. Um, but also, even in the absence of broken pipes, we, we have seen voids occurring beneath roads. Um, and, and particularly in, in, in high rainfall events or even in snow events and with subsequent melt, uh, we're getting those voids being expressed or manifested. And um, so here's another uh, case of what we call network interdependency. So obviously the roadway's been compromised. Again, the water network, see right there, that thing there uh, uh, is, a man, is an access um, into pipes under the street, right there. And so the, the, this wheel may very well have, have, got, have gone through a couple of pipes. Another key thing that a lot of people haven't really been thinking about is how this compromises other aspects of our daily lives that we usually take for granted, such as our recycling pickup. And so this is a key example of how the physical damage to an infrastructure lifeline, in this case, it's buried pipes and or the roads, can compromise other um, aspects of our lives that we take for granted. That's the infrastructure lifelines. So that's the uh, buried pipes, water pipes, uh, and roads. And of course, we're all aware of the significant damage uh, to the urban environment as far as the buildings go. So um, this is um, Madras Street along here. And this is just an example um, of some engineers going out after the February quake. And what we're seeing here is basically no subsidence on this corner of the building, and up to 42 centimetres subsidence on that corner of the building. So that's sufficient for that building to be a write-off. In fact, all the, pretty much all the buildings in this area are gone, it's open space. Uh, here's another example um, of the impacts of both liquefaction and lateral spreading. So you can see here how this building has, has subsided, this is 50 centimetres subsidence here, 20 centimetres here. And so that differential settlement, again, has caused this building to be a write-off. You can see here how the edge of the building is sunk into the ground here. Uh, and also you can see the, this big crack through here as a result of lateral spreading. 
Here's another example from Kaiapoi that Mark mentioned before of one of the impacts of lateral spreading. So uh, basically lateral spreading occurs because um, uh, uh, as a result of liquefaction, uh, we get blocks of what we call the soil crust um, slumping into waterways, and that sort of pulling motion can actually um, have uh, impacts on the ground and structures hundreds of metres away from the waterway. And this is an example of that in Kaiapoi. And so you can see this is a 1.6 metre wide crack that has opened up. Here's another example of one of those cracks going right through a house. We'll say, um, to re re reiterate um, a point that Mark made, is that um, these buildings did their job. They're write-offs, but these ones didn't collapse. And as you're aware, most of the fatalities in the 22nd of February earthquake occurred in two buildings. Um, and, uh, and the story of those, those buildings is playing out. Um, but actually, most of the builders in Christchurch did their job. Uh, they withstood uh, uh, an essentially unprecedented and unexpected um, a, a range of earthquake motions in the city. Um, unfortunately, uh, the way to, one of the ways to think about this is that they were like a motorcycle helmet. So you have a crash, you fall off your motorcycle and smack your head on the ground. The motorcycle helmet does its job of saving your life, but you have to throw the motorcycle helmet away. That's the way that these buildings behaved. All right, so the title on, on my slide here, and what you should see up there, is something called the sinking city. So I've spoken some, about some impacts on the built environment, um, and now we're going to be talking about uh, uh, the impacts of the quakes on the ground itself from a wider perspective. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this image um, was actually in an article that Mark and I had published in August in the press. Did, it was called Where to Next for Our Sinking City. Did anyone see that at all? I was curious. <laughs> you mean the map itself? If you want to identify sort of aerial certain properties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's a very good point. Um, that map was never intended for that. Okay. okay. Um, it was to sort of give people an overview, sort of a global perspective across the city. Um, um, of that. So just a couple of things about this. There's a poster over there called LIDAR, which gives you a bit of information about how the, these data were collected. Um, so what LIDAR is, it stands for Light Detection and Ranging. So it's basically a laser-based system. So an aircraft flies across the city and fires a laser at the ground, and the laser signals bounce back to the aircraft. And depending upon the height of the aircraft and the time it takes for the signal to return, you can build up a very detailed model of the ground surface. And fortuitously, the uh, ECAN, the Regional Council, did this in 2003 across the city uh, for flood modelling. Uh, and, and certainly not every city in New Zealand um, has done that um, at all. And so we were quite fortuitous uh, to have that piece of information because then, of course, we had our earthquakes. And following each major earthquake, the September one, um, uh, the February, June and December ones, subsequent overflights were done and more LIDAR data was collected. So what we're looking at here is the 2003 ground surface, and subtracted from that is, is the post-December 2011 ground surface to get, um, basically, it's a simple subtraction to see the differences um, um, uh, between across that period. So these are essentially all the vertical ground movements or vertical changes on the ground from 2003 to the start of 2012. And there are some very interesting things in here. Up on the uh, legend up here, Maybe a bit hard for you to see, but basically from this very pale green through to dark blue, that's where the ground has gone up. Over here, from a very pale yellow down to this magenta, that's where the ground has subsided, it's gone down. Now a couple of things about this, see this area through here, all the greens and blues? That is a result, large, uh, mainly the result of the February earthquake, um, and here's, here's one of the fault traces that Mark showed you before for the 22nd of February earthquakes. Um, basically, the ground through there tectonically popped up and across much of the rest of the city, it dropped. And so we've actually had the ground move up through here. We've also had some, uh, um, some upwards movement on the spit, but, that, but in many places it's actually gone down. And in fact, some of the areas on the strip uh, along by the estuary here have been red zoned. Um, so uh, some of these dark, see these dark blue patches here and up through here? and up through there, and also by the, the oxidation ponds, um, uh, the sewage treatment plant works here. Uh, that isn't earthquake related at all. This is um, a map of the ground changes, um, and that includes earthworks. 
and it's all ground infilling due to suburban and industrial development. And that's the, that's, those patches of blue are what we are seeing there. Um, also, you might be able to see this patch of blue and a strip of blue up along the beach. That is an overall um, accumulation of sand on the beach over this period of time that we're talking about. So, th so, the, so the uplift there in dark blue are sort of human impacts on the ground um, surface and also natural uh, sand dynamics on the beach. But pretty much everything else through here, the, the um, sort of pale greens through to slightly darker greens, are earthquake tectonic uplift in that part of the city. Which also means, by the way, we've had relative sea level fall in these areas. The high tides don't reach inland as much as they used to in those areas. But the main story here, and the reason that we've called it the sinking city, is most of the city's gone down. And so Mark has already described liquefaction and lateral spreading, and, uh, and the, the net results of those two things is that the ground surface drops. Um, and as you can see here, um, these particularly a uh, bit hard to distinguish these two patches, but what these are is that 40 centimetres to a metre, all the dark reds there, the, those areas of the city have dropped um, by about that to about that. And the magenta colour, um, which is a bit harder to see around the place, but particularly around through here in Bexley, of course, uh, we've got greater than a metre. And some areas dropped more than two metres. Not very many, but that did occur. Um, uh, this little cross-section here is of the Avon, and it's just illustrating the fact, again, a bit hard to see here, um, but what we've got here is the pre-earthquake cross-section across the river and the floodplains, the banks of the, of the Avon. Um, and the black line there is showing how the floodplains have dropped. Uh, we've also got uh, the bottom of the river rising because of the liquefaction silt accumulating in the rivers. And you may be aware that there has been a significant dredging program as part of the restoration of the waterways. And also um, the banks have slumped inwards. So what those things mean is that we've got a pinching or narrowing or a decrease in the capacity of the river to hold water at that point in combination with the associated floodplains dropping, which means we have an increased flooding hazard. The green marks there are actually the stop banks that were constructed by the City Council and ECAN after the February quake. So what this map is showing us is that um, uh, uh, we have had uh, basically a significant increase in flood hazard on the floodplains of particularly the Avon River. I'll also note, by the way, see here, this is the Heathkit. So the upper reaches of the Heathkit have dropped, but the lower reaches where it, uh, issues into the estuary have gone up. And so if you can imagine that the gradient of the Heathkit was like that before the quakes, it's essentially done that. It's sort of levelled out. And so that also has increased the flooding hazard. So there's, it's quite a complicated story of what's been going on, but the simple result, uh, the simple uh, message is, is that we now have increased flooding hazard um, just through te uh, te tectonic movements and associated liquefaction and lateral spreading. What this means in terms of uh, sea level rise is that we've had uh, a relative sea level rise around the margins um, of the estuary, the northern margins of the estuary. Uh, this is an example of that. And so uh, here, this, this magenta star here um, is approximately um, uh, just south of, uh, of South Brighton Bridge. And what we're seeing here, this is a photo I took about three weeks ago, um, going on a bit of a, a tour around the estuary with one of the council um, park rangers who, who's out there pretty much every day. And, um, and so here uh, we just sort of revisited some areas that have subsided and gone up. This is an example of vegetation that is now dying off due to salt stress. Um, uh, this sort of vegetation, and please, uh, the botanists among you or those interested, I can't tell you the genus and species right now, but it is a species that is tolerant of brackish to more fresher water um, and is now being inundated by the high tides and the plants are dying off. So even if we didn't have this basically world-class, unprecedented digital data set of ground movements, actually the coastal ecosystems are telling us that the ground has subsided and we've had relative sea level rise. This has lots of implications for all sorts of things, um, particularly um, uh, in the context of coastal erosion and the impacts of waves, particularly during storms on eroding sediments and, and, and the coastline in this part of the estuary. Uh, basically, if the vegetation is dying off, it's not providing strength or a buffer to the, to the wave action that is impacting upon the coast. Um, the full implications of that we don't really understand yet, but of course, 
we know what we sort of can see what's happening now and we're keeping an eye on it and we'll continue to do so uh, into the future. All, and I have to uh, sort of finish off on this one. Uh, all that is, this is occurring, of course, in the context of global anthropogenic uh, climate change. Or, or so the terminology we tend to use now in this field is, is anthropogenic. And we are now going, currently living through an age of anthropogenic, which means human-caused, climate disruption. Um, and it's, it's happening right now. We're living through it. Uh, the uh, evidence uh, is uh, largely irrefutable. And so uh, what we're looking at here is, uh, this is from 1800 to about 1870, uh, we have pretty poor records of, of sea level rise globally. Um, uh, the black line here, um, you can, there's, uh, there has been a bit of a rise since essentially the birth of the Industrial Re Revolution in Europe, uh, and this, this is from evidence uh, looking at sediment cores and marshes and estuaries and things like that. Um, it, it's, it's not very precise data though. However, from about the 1870s, uh, and throughout the 20th century, uh, we have um, uh, tidal gauge records uh, from around the world, and this is a compilation of those records. You might not be able to see it here, but there are error bars here, and those error bars means that we, we have more uncertainty about the quality or exactness of that data, but these error bars are getting much, much narrower and smaller as we go through time because we're getting better ways of measuring these things on the tidal gauges. As you can see, you can see there's a general trend, there's a general rise, um, a moderate rise in the rate of sea level rise um, throughout the early 20th century. You can see here uh, uh, basically a hiatus where uh, basically sea levels stopped rising for a few decades over that period. And interestingly, um, we, we seem to be going through a similar period now. Um, and, but then after about um, you know, the 1930s, we're getting this rise. But you can see what's been happening post-World War II in combination with an explosion in the global economy and the increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we start at the sea levels are like the mercury in the thermometer. They are going up in response to global warming. And it's not a perfect rise, it's up and down. And this green thing there is actually satellite observations. We now are in the era of not only having the tidal records around the planet, but also we've got satellite observations which, are, which give us even higher resolution information about sea level rise. What these things are here are projections, or predictions. Uh, some of the most important predictions that humans have ever made um, about the trajectory of future sea level rise in response to warming of the planet. And as you can see, I'm not going to go into the details of, of, why, of, of, of all this, but as you can see here, these imply smooth rises. You see this is a smooth curve. We actually know it doesn't work like that. We know it actually goes, it's jittery. It's jittery, it goes up and it goes down a bit and it goes up further and it goes down a bit. But you can see what the general trend is. But what these are are different scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions throughout the 21st century. Um, and also um, that's sort of this window through here and how that might um, contribute to melting of glaciers and mountain glaciers and, and a thermal expansion of the oceans and things like this. This stuff here, and this big blue window, is taking into account the possible rises uh, if, for example, the ice, ice sh uh, sheets in Greenland and Antarctica start to melt very rapidly, which we are now observing that they are. And so, uh, just to step back to this. So when we think about Christchurch and the fact that we know now that earthquakes cause increased flooding hazard, and we look at this at the background signal of global sea level rise. We've got some very interesting challenges ahead of us in Christchurch. This is by no means a doom and gloom sort of message. There are some very serious things that we have to confront head on. Um, um, but we've got the science behind understanding what's going on. And hopefully that means we can all be on the same page with what's happening around us. And I guess then we can actually tackle the real hard stuff of what we do from here as a community. And I'll finish on that. Thank you very much.